Hello everyone, um, I'm Cassandra Wong, I'm the community librarian here in Gilroy. I just wanted to welcome you all to join, your, to join us, fill into your seats. We have seats available and um, we'll be beginning in, in just a second. So thank you very much for coming today and we're, we're on a roll. So, what an event, what an honor for us to have our distinguished panel, but also all of you. We are so glad you were able to join us today. I have a few, I'm, I know everybody's time is precious, so I'm just going to say a few things and we'll get going. Um, again, I've been at this library since 2020, and I have to say, this community is so warm and welcoming and amazing, and I am so proud to be able to present these types of programs for you all. Um, it's just an amazing place to be, Gilroy is. Um, we have translations available in Spanish. If you would like a pair of headphones, they are located uh, to stage left. There's headphones over here available if you'd like real-time audio translation. Uh, our double doors over here have the restrooms. And if you have any questions or need any assistance, we have ushers available at the ends of the aisles. I will take up no more of your time because I know you're excited for this panel. Thank you again for joining us. And I'm introducing our county librarian, Jennifer Weeks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm Jennifer Weeks. I'm the director and county librarian of the Santa Clara County Library District. So it's really my honor to welcome you to today's exciting discussion with voices from the Smithsonian exhibit, Dolores Huerta, Revolution in the Field, right next door at the Gilroy Library. And it's there through January 2023. I hope you've all had a chance to visit. So through this traveling exhibit, Visitors really learn about the collective power of the farm workers movement and Dolores's important legacy. And we're thrilled to have the opportunity to hear directly from those who lived this incredible story. The library's mission focuses on providing opportunities for discovery and lifelong learning. And the discussion and exhibit just here in Gilroy is really here in this community that's been deeply impacted by this important history. So I wanna thank the Gilroy Library team, especially librarian Elizabeth Munoz Rosas for their work. It has been a true collaboration with the city of Gilroy, the Smithsonian civic leaders, the Gilroy City Council members, the South County Youth Task Force, the Department of Parks and Rec, um, and the South County Collaborative Group. And really, it's all working together successfully to present this program to you. So I hope you enjoy the experience and you come away inspired and enlightened. And now I'd like to bring Elizabeth to the mic to introduce our esteemed panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, let me just say in Spanish, tenemos servicios de traducción aquí de este lado. So, para los que necesiten traducción en español, uh, se pueden referir aquí a esta esquina. Uh, like Jennifer said, my name is Elizabeth Muñoz Rosas. Um, I've been uh, in library, yeah, the Gilroy Library for 10 years, and I'm so proud to be here. <laughs> I'm so emotional. <laughs> Thank you. I'm emotional because uh, I see all of you. You all look beautiful. <laughs> you look amazingly beautiful. Thank you so much 
for have coming here, different generations, different life journeys, different experiences, all trying to continue their lifelong learning. And I hope um, this program inspires you, motivates you, gets you going, and continue learning about the farm workers, about their experiences, about resiliency, and overall about how to make a positive impact in our community. They say it takes a village to raise a child. And I think we are the community right now. We are extending beyond these city limits. I know we have people coming from Fresno, all the way from the Bay Area, far, two, three hours to come and see them. And I hope you get inspired and take this to your communities. I just feel <laughs> your, your positive vibe is, is very good right now in this moment. Um, but before anything, let me, let me begin with the introduction. So I will not be listing all of their accomplishments, all of their awards. Um, if I may say, we have amazing books at the Gilroy Library <laughs> about them. <laughs> so you can always visit us. Um, and I'm going to talk about how many of you express your experiences with them and how their journeys and their accomplishments help you in life. So let me begin by introducing, let's start with Panchito. <laughs> <laughs> Francisco Jimenez. <laughs> and many of you said that's the author that always makes me cry. <laughs> that's the author, that's the boy who lost his coins in that fire. I want to give him some of my coins. I want to hear him speak. So we all know Dr. Francisco Jimenez writes from the heart, and he's here with us to share his experience. In your pamphlet, he writes a note about how our life journeys, if we share it with one another, we become one humanity. And it's very telling in his books as well. The next person that I have is Mr. Luis Valdez. I went all... <laughs> When I went to distribute flyers all the way in Salinas, Hollister, um, San Juan Bautista, Monterey area, the first thing they would say, did you know that he helped found um, the Monterey State University? Did you know he's the father of Chicano theater? Did you know he directed La Bamba? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> And um, it was very interesting. I was like, I'm a librarian. I think I know a little bit about him. <laughs> but they were so happy to inform me that they, they know a lot about him. A lot of youth didn't know that we have a theater just down the block right here in San Juan Bautista. So it was very important for me to tell them, San Juan Bautista, you know, El Campesino Theater is here. It's just down the block. The next person that we have is La Mujer en Movimiento. It's Dolores Huerta. La que ayuda. <laughs> Many of them say, es la que ayuda a los campesinos. That was mainly what most of you said, the one that helps the farm workers. The voice of the farm workers. For me, it is especially important because she motivated my dad to actually leave the fields and improve himself. And that's why I went to school. And that's why I'm here today. It's all because of her. So for me, it's a full circle in this moment. Thank you. And last but not least, Damien Trujillo. He, <laughs> Damien Trujillo, I consider him a contemporary hero for us. La mama always says, es el de la tele, mija, es el de la tele. Like, that's right, that's Damien Trujillo. And when, uh, you know, he, when I contacted him, 
he was so humbled by this opportunity, but for me it was a dream come true. Like how, how else can I you know, thank him for doing this for me? Thank you so much, Damien, for doing all this work. And now I'm gonna say, take it away, Damien, it's all yours. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, you know, I don't know what I'm doing up here. Um, I don't belong up here. When um, I was asked to be uh, one of the panelists for this thing, and I said, I, I don't belong on that stage with these icons. I said, I'll be willing to moderate it for you, um, but I don't belong on the same stage because, I mean, look at these folks. Uh, and so I'm just, I'm really, really, really humbled to be amongst uh, some great company here. So thank you for allowing me to be here. A quick story just to kick it all off. Um, Remember when you, the first day back to school during your summer vacation, and your teacher would ask to break the ice, what did you do during your summer vacation? And in my class, Jimmy would raise, we went to Disneyland, all right. And then uh, Mary, well, we went to Yosemite, we went camping, far out. Uh, and then somebody else would say, we went to Great America for a couple of weeks, oh, that's great. And then when it would get to me, I would lie. I would lie because I was ashamed and embarrassed to tell my class that I spent my summers as a farm worker. I was embarrassed and ashamed to say that I spent my summers with mud on my hands and dust on my face. And I share that with you now because I can honestly say that after 26 years at NBC, farm work is the best job I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> And it's the best job because it, it humbles you, right? Farm work humbles you, and it teaches you to appreciate everything you have now. So why don't we do a big clap for the farm workers who are there now. Before we get to the scripted questions, Dolores, your reaction to this? I mean, this has got to be humbling, Damien. Well, when you were saying that, I remember driving uh, down the road in the summer and you see people going by with their boats on their cars and you know, they have all the <laughs> stuff packed up because they, they said they're gonna go camping. And then you would see all the farm workers, you know, coming up from wherever they were uh, migrating from, coming to do the work. And I would think, of, I would reflect on that all the time when I was driving up and down the 99, you know, or the five. And, and seeing the, the farm workers that they were coming to do the work, you know, uh, migrating from one place to the other. And back in those days when we started, they didn't have unemployment insurance. I mean, they had no option. You know, they really had to go from one place to the other to continue to do the work. And not only that, but when we first started organizing the farm worker community, they couldn't even give them a, what they call the surplus food, which we now know as a food bank. And because they had a law that you had to live in one county for 12 months. And you had to show the rent receipts, wow. and you had to show the utility. And if you didn't have a proof that you were in one county for 12 months, you couldn't even get the surplus food. I mean, that's how bad it was for farmers. No, it, and, and I think it was Caesar who said that, it, it, back then it was true and it's true now that farm workers can't even afford to buy the food that they're picking. I mean, how embarrassing is that? Um, opening statements, Don Luis, it's an honor to be here with you, sir. Uh, and again, look at this reception that uh, y'all are getting. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be here with Dolores, uh, lifelong friend and leader, first general I ever followed into war. There was a woman. And uh, so it's a fundamental change uh, for me to participate in the Delano Grape Strike. I was born in Delano in a farm labor camp uh, on the west side in Chinatown and uh, in 1940 and my family uh, was on the migrant path uh, before I could walk so in 1941 uh, we were uh, over here in San Martin uh, living in a barn because we were traveling uh, with my tío and my tía and my cousins and, and our family was a little, little young family but uh, the farmer essentially moved the cows out and put the Mexicans in, you know. Wow. And so we were picking prunes and apricots and then prunes in this area. 
And uh, one morning when we were getting ready to go to work, uh, uh, I got too close to a little portable stove that we carried, which was just a tina, you know, it was a tub with a hole on the side. And my tia and my mom would put wood underneath and that would become the stove. And when we, it was time to move, we would put it up on the car, on the truck, and that was it. Well, one morning, uh, a bit of carelessness, no one noticed that I was gateando, you know, I was crawling, starting to walk. I got too close to the stove and I had a little cousin who could walk and there was a little pan of hot water boiling on, on the stove and she grabbed it and it burned her and she dropped it and it fell on my back. And uh, I screamed and passed, I don't remember this, you know, they told me this, and passed out. My dad grabbed me and put me in a blanket and they brought me to Wheeler Hospital right here. And uh, they opened up the blanket and all the skin on my back sloughed off and part of my face. And my mother, who had just lost my brother before me due to a congenital stomach problem, was very afraid that uh, she was gonna lose another son. I was her third son. And uh, so they treated me somehow. It was a white hospital. We were a hospital, it was a white hospital. And here we were, migrant farm workers, 1941. It's before Pearl Harbor. They didn't know what to do with me. so. They put some kind of stuff on my back and they released me into my mother's care. Now that's both good and bad. I've always believed you can turn a positive into a, a negative into a positive. So what happened is that I think that if they've left me in the hospital, I would have felt abandoned by my mother. So the opposite happened. I went back to the barn with my mother, but for the next six months, my mother was only 20 years old. I slept on her stomach, face to face, heart to heart. And that empowered me that not only the blast of hot scalding water in my back, se me echó la pompa andar, if you know what I'm saying, uh, <laughs> but also mother's love, you know, heart to heart for the next six months. I had a very special relationship with my mother, God bless her, she's gone now. Uh, she sleeps up in San Juan Bautista. Mm. But the fact is that uh, that changed my life. It, it, it gave me uh, an energy that I, I, I don't know where it comes from, but. It was being close to death, I guess, and my mother's love to bring me back to life. And maybe that's the reason why uh, I settled with El Teatro Campesino in San Juan Bautista, because sometimes the worst moments can become the best moments. And even though that's one of the tragic moments in my family's life, it became a victorious moment because it over I overcame it with my mother's love and, uh, and I was ready for life, you know, once she gave me her energy. So I'm very happy to be here at Wheeler Center it's full circle. Okay? Oh, full oh, circle. Oh, oh. That's beautiful. Um, how many of you had read one of Dr. Jimenez's Mira nomas. Look at that. <laughs> Dr. Jimenez, your reaction again to the accolades here. Well, for, first of all, I want to thank Elizabeth for inviting us for inviting me to participate in, in this panel. And I feel um, privileged to be in the same panel with Luis and Dolores Huerta, who I consider um, my heroes. And I don't know if you know this, but both of you in, um, had a tremendous influence in my life, personally and professionally. When I was a senior in Santa, Santa Clara High, um, University, I joined Cesar Chavez on that march in 1966. And for the first time, I saw some of the actos that, uh, that Luis uh, performed. Uh, and then uh, when we got to Sacramento on Easter Sunday, and I heard Dolores and, and Cesar Chavez talk about social justice and uh, giving of oneself for others. And, and behind them was the, the, the flag, Mexican flag and the uh, American flag and the banner of La Virgen de Guadalupe. And at that moment I said, um, I, am, I will spend my life trying to help the plight of farm workers. I had no idea how I was going to do that, but I made that promise. But, and so I was inspired by both of your work. And when I was in graduate school, I wanted to do my doctoral dissertation on El Teatro Campesino. Uh, it was not approved, 
but, <laughs> but, but anyway, I, I, did, um, I did write a, a paper, uh, published a paper on the Teatro Campesino and, and the value that it brought to our, our community. So I thank you for, for, for inspiring me. And of course, uh, Damien Trujillo is another one of my heroes. I, uh, for all the work that he does for our community and his family, uh, it's an incredible gift that, uh, that he gives to all of us. So I, I'm very pleased to be here. I feel very much at home uh, knowing that many of you uh, came from humble backgrounds similar to the families that my, similar to my family. And so I, um, I feel uh, grateful to the work that you do and the work that your ancestors did so that we could have a better life. So thank you for being here. I, I asked Dr. Jimenez to talk about himself and he talks about everybody else. This kind of shows the character. And I hope you don't mind, uh, Don Luis. Uh, Lupe, can you please stand? Uh, Luis is better half Lupe Valdez, who's been there everywhere. And I think everybody has the same question, Dolores. If you don't mind, where do you get your energy for so many years? <laughs> well, I think I'm blessed. Um, it could be because I'm a vegetarian. Everybody, <laughs> and, and actually, uh, you know, uh, my partner Richard Chavez, he said, you're an energy vampire, okay? <laughs> he said, when you're around people, you take away their energy, you, you, you leave them all exhausted. So, I don't know if that's true or not. But I think uh, just that we have so much work to do, we have so many people that we have to convince them that they can be activists, that they can be organizers, that all of us, this is the great Fred Ross, and he's the one that trained us to be organizers, Fred Ross Sr., and that's what he told us, you know, you, we have to just go out there. And he used to say, there is nothing as important for you to do today as to get out there and organize. And we know we just went through an election, and all of us know people that didn't vote, you know? Really, what's up with that? You know, <laughs> knowing that so much is on the line. And uh, I was canvassing, I'm sure many of you were canvassing. It, it, phone sorry, ticket. it's exhausting, Dolores, because in the, I'm not, we're doing the numbers for this main election. In the primaries, 15% of Latinos voted in California. That's embarrassing. It is, considering that we are the power that we are right now. We're the majority in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Okay, and in the Central Valley of California with the majority uh, here in the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley, and in California we're 40% of the population. So when we think that we have all of that power, but so many of our people do not understand that they've got that power. And so that's why we have to be out there. You know, I always think of organizing as, as like having some kind of magic dust, okay? You go into a community and you throw the dust at people and you get them excited and you get them organized and then they become activists, okay? So that's why we can't give up and I can't give up. Yeah, we need some Dolores dust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll go to the scripted questions. Uh, Don Luis, this is from uh, MFT uh, Ana Morante, the lead of a Resilient Families Group in Gilroy. It says, everyone talks about resiliency now in times of the triple pandemic of racial inequality, economic collapse, and COVID. Uh, do you think there is a new consciousness or view of resiliency now in our community? What is the consciousness for resilience now? Do you think there is a new consciousness or view of resiliency in our community? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, again, don't be deceived by uh, the other side, You're the negatives that are uh, afraid about and attacking democracy and attacking everything that's happening. The reason that they're so stirred up on the right and on the extreme right particularly is because there has been progress. You know, not as much as we all would like, but there has definitely been progress. Uh, I haven't followed Dolores for more than 50 years uh, without noticing that the world has changed around us. I remember uh, when Dolores and, and um, 
Cesar started. I was in high school living in Salsipuedes in 1950s, in the mid-1950s, when Cesar was still living there. And he had met Fred Ross, and he had met Dolores Huerta, and they were out there organizing uh, by registering people to vote. That's so basic, you know, but now we can see, right now in the general election, the control of Congress is hinging on a number of votes in the San Joaquin Valley, for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. Because it's the grower-supported right wing that has controlled the political power in the San Joaquin Valley. Now, the only thing that can possibly change that are the farm workers and their children who will turn around and become citizens and vote and then change the dynamic of the San Joaquin Valley. It doesn't have to be a, a basket of, of exploitation. And so I am encouraged, I am inspired by the progress that has been made. Don't let the white male view that is in despair throw you. Women are moving forward. Thank God, finally, women are being acknowledged yes. for their leadership. And, and we have the exemplary leader in America right here in terms of woman power. She is an embodiment of woman power. And all the young women that are alive today need to take inspiration and to know that they have stake in the future and that they can make things happen. But don't let the young men get intimidated either. Don't back off. Keep moving. Share the space. Share the power. Share the future, because the future is ours. I'd hate to go after you. Um. Can I just say? <laughs> I know, that's why you told me. Good luck, Dr. Jimenez. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I want to I emphasize the, the point that you made. Uh, we have made progress. Yes. And, um, for example, the, uh, Senator Padilla, who was just elected, right? That, and, the, and then we have the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court Justice of the State of California, San Latina. Patricia, you know? Patricia Guerrero. Yeah, Guerrero. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and there are, I think, 45, not enough, of course, but about 45 um, legislators that, that, that are now uh, Latinos. Mm -hmm. So, um, when, when we look back, when we started, to where we are now, we have made progress. And we should focus on, on the positive and not the negative. And I think as long as we continue to uh, have hope and, and, uh, and, and faith that we can make more progress, we will do that. But we cannot let uh, anything um, detract us from, from our goals. And that is to, to, to help everybody in our, in our community to improve our lives and the lives of their children. So I, I think that's, that's an important message that you just gave about, um, you know, that uh, you, we have to get, become engaged and, and uh, vote and, uh, and not give up. Mm. No, si se puede. Si se puede. Right? Si se puede. <laughs> I would like to add uh, to the positives. Let's go ahead, Dolores. Sorry. No, I just wanted to add to the, the, to the positives. Uh, you know, over the years we have had, uh, as speakers of the assembly, uh, several Latinos. We had Antonio Villaragosa, Fabian Nunez, um, uh, John Perez. Uh, but this year, in June, we're going to have the first speaker of the assembly here in California uh, from a rural area, and he's a grandson of farm workers. You know, and his family lives here in Gilroy, okay? And Robert Rivas, okay? So let's give him a big yeah. hey. <laughs> Bravo. Robert is a veteran of farm worker housing, so uh, he, he gets it. And, um, the topic is, is resiliency, um, Dolores, and we're not going to embarrass anybody here by asking who voted and who didn't vote. Uh, it's easy to get discouraged when you see the numbers that we're not voting, 
But what's kept you resilient? Because it's easy to throw your hands in the air and say, well, you know what? Todo es para nada. Nothing's changing. What's kept you resilient for so long to say, okay, we, maybe we failed or we didn't do as well here, but there's still uh, the, the higher calling, the bigger goal. Well, I mean, I can, uh, as you all may know, I'm 92 years old, 92 and a half, actually. <laughs> 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 but I remember when I was going to college, in fact, even in high school, by the time I graduated from high school, most of my friends, uh, Latinos, Asians, Blacks, they had dropped out or pushed out, okay? You know, we have to forget that word drop out, it's a push out, okay? Because that's what's been happening to all of our kids. They've been pushed out. And again, when I went to college, there were maybe five of us, you know, that went to college, Latinos, and a couple of them changed their names from Martinez to Martin, mm. you know, from Estrella to Star, you know, because they didn't want to even identify as Latinos. And now we know that all over the United States of America, you've got what they call Hispanic serving institutions, where many universities and colleges now, half of, their, uh, of the students are Latinos, no? So we know that that is big progress, and also for women. There are now more women, I think, uh, uh, in law school, uh, in, in the becoming attorneys, more women than men, as we know. And we have a lot of women that, that now they're becoming engineers and doctors. So we, we can see that there's a lot of progress that has been made. But we know that, that progress has been pushed back. And we all saw that, saw that uh, when Trump was president, right, with his, with his attacks on the Latino community. And so uh, we, we, that's why we say we, we can't just sit back and say, OK, it's all done, because it isn't all done. You know, we still have a lot of work to do uh, to really make sure that we get the representation and the voices and the policies that we need that will help our communities. Mm. All right. And Don Luis, you can probably talk about this for an hour. This is a community question from uh, the group. How does your heritage inspire your creativity? My heritage, oh my God. <laughs> you know, again, I've always believed you could turn a negative into a positive. And uh, when I was born, like a lot of us, uh, being Mexican was not uh, the most optimum thing. You know, you were several <laughs> steps behind if you were Mexican. So as a matter of fact, people didn't want to call themselves Mexican. It's got that X in it, you know, it's like Jew. It's very harsh. Uh, but uh, Mexican actually is a mispronunciation. It's Mexicano. And that speaks to the millennia of American history. We are American history. We are America. We're the root. We're Native Americans because of our heritage. We have been here for 30,000 years or more. They still don't know, 35, 40, 50. We've had civilizations come and go in this time. So don't be deceived, somebody tells you Mexican is something negative, it's not. It's the most positive thing there is in America in terms of heritage, uh, together with the Inca, because it goes back to the origins of this hemisphere. And so out of that comes treasures, treasures, incredible treasures. I've said for 50 years, we need to study the Maya. We need to study the, uh, the Aztec are derived from the Maya. The Maya, the Olmec, those are the ori origins you know, of, of the culture. And we live with it. We live with it. It's tortillas and beans to us. You know, it's in our daily lives and we don't know it. Learn to recognize what the signs are. Learn to know what the positives are. Which is why I, I emphasize the arts so much because being creative is when your soul begins to speak for itself. You don't need to be highly educated. You don't have to be educated at all to be creative. You do it with your hands, con las manos. You can make music, you can make clay, you can make clothes, you can make food. You can make a house. You know, all of that is creativity that's inherent in you. And our ancestors left us clues as to how to lead a better life. But so, there's so much ignorance that, that people turn it upside down and they consider it to be a burden and a negative, and it isn't. It is something that we need to share with the rest of the world. The rest of the world's already eating it anyway. They're eating corn, they're eating tomatoes, you know, they're eating potatoes, they're eating stuff that came from this hemisphere from our ancestors. And so uh, we fed the world in its own way. The world has also fed us. I don't believe that you need to praise being Mexican at the expense of somebody else's culture. Uh, I'm speaking English. I'm an Anglo. You know, I was born and raised in this country, so I couldn't help becoming an Anglo. 
I became a brown Anglo, you know? But I decided to call myself a Chicano, you know? Con una poquito de, 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 de raza, you know, un poquito de, de calo. Orale vato, you know? <laughs> We're making, you know, ontological sense. Monkey, yes, you know? But, but the thing is that these are the games that we played in college, you know, to reaffirm our identity. But there's nothing wrong with learning English or French or German or Chinese or China. Chinese or, or Vietnamese, it doesn't matter what the language is, we're all human beings and we all have something to gain from each other. Let us learn to live with each other. But America has got to be honest about itself. America has got to acknowledge who was here first, who was here the longest, who has been here contributing food and structures and ideas and heart and culture and music and food, all of that. And it's our people, it's the so-called Mexicans, the lowest of the low that are really at the top of the pyramid. I can follow up on that. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Luis, because Luis has always uh, been there to instill that consciousness in us of who we are. And uh, I'm reading this book. I'm sure you have read it, Luis, probably you have also. Uh, it's called the Open Veins of Latin America mm. by Eduardo Galeano. Mm. If, if you can uh, read this book, I'm, I'm recommended to everybody. Because he traces from the conquest 500 years ago, you know, the conquest in Latin America, Central America, Mexico, and the way that the indigenous people were treated. Uh, millions, millions of were is, is enslaved, and many of them that died from diseases and, and the, the type of treatment they, that they were receiving, and also the uh, people that came from Africa because they killed so many indigenous people that they had to replace them with more bodies, and that those are the, the slaves that they bought from Africa. And all of the gold and the jewels and the minerals that they took from Latin America and sent it to Europe, okay? That's how Europe became strong and rich because of all of the resources that they took from Latin America. And I was, uh, I was at a, uh, to show the progress that we still have to make, uh, I was at a, an event the other day where they were uh, celebrating Dr. Greg Boyle, who started the Homeboy Industries, guys that are coming out of prison. You know? And I really didn't know what to say, but then I was thinking, because uh, I'm reading that book, and the faces of those indigenous people that were enslaved are the same faces that we see in our prisons today. So let me matar us, you know what I mean? You know, of the, not only the indigenous people, but the African descendants of the slaves, you know? These are the same people, and these are the people that we are fighting for. And so, the same thing, uh, the, the school to prison pipeline, that my foundation, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, that we're fighting to change that. These are the, the, these are the faces of the people that are in poverty in different cities throughout the United States of America. So while we talk about the progress that we're making, we still have to see how much more that we need to do. You know, only 2% of the teachers in the United States are bilingual, only 2%. And yet our population is growing. And we know that our children, our students are not being taught the history that Luis was talking about. You know, the great agricultural systems that they had, the great farming systems that the indigenous people had, that the Europeans, like, you know, my great-grandmother <laughs> who came from Spain and my other great-grandfather who came from England, you know, those are the true immigrants right to this country. You know, we are the indigenous people of this and our children have to know this and they have to know about the great astronomers and the great people that we had uh, in the indigenous population. And then when we talk about the land that was taken, I'm gonna quote Cesar Chavez who said, we'll get it back we're going to buy it back, lot by lot. <laughs> <laughs> and kudos to the city of Gilroy for just passing this week uh, and, and making uh, uh, Cesar Chavez a, a city holiday. Um, we're waiting for the day when there's a Dolores Huerta uh, state and federal <laughs> holiday as well. Hey. Dr. Jimenez, you could have used being a farm worker, a migrant farm worker, uh, an immigrant as an excuse for failure, as an excuse not to make it. 
Um, you know, I, I didn't progress because I was a farm worker, no tuve la capacidad, so that's why. But you, you accepted the challenge of being a farm worker, um, and you are where you are now. It goes back to the word resiliency. The same question I asked uh, uh, Don Luis, um, the, uh, how does your heritage um, inspire your creativity? Well, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't read my work, I, I came to this country when I was four years old, and uh, we crossed the border without documentation. We began as migrant workers picking strawberries in Santa Maria, and then we would go to the San Joaquin Valley to pick grapes, and then to Corcoran to pick cotton, and then we would come back to Santa Maria to pick uh, carrots and thin lettuce with a short handle hoe. Mm. Um, and that, that life uh, um, was hard, um, but my mother was always very optimistic. She would say, Panchito, no hay que perder la esperanza. No hay que perder la fe. No hay que perder el respeto a sí mismo y a otras personas. Let us not lose our faith and hope. And she would say, because if we lose faith, if we lose hope, and if we lose respect for, for, for ourselves and for others, what do we have left, mijo? What do we have left? So I learned from my mother that those values that, that I carry with me even today, and I try to inculcate my children and my grandchildren in those values. Um, so, and, I was, and my father would always say, be proud of being Mexican. And people, and, and, I, I, and I had a, a one of the custodians with whom I worked when I was in high school said, you know, you shouldn't tell people you're Mexican, you're white. Tell them, that, tell them that you're American. And I would say, no. My father said I should be proud of who I am, and I am proud. So, so I, I learned to be proud of my heritage through my father and, and, my, and my parents. Um, and then when I, but I experienced discrimination just like you were saying, um, when I was in the first grade, I, uh, you know, I, I failed because I didn't know English well enough. And so uh, they changed my name from uh, Francisco to uh, Frank and then Frankie. Um, and then um, when I was in high school, I, uh, my older brother and I um, were not permitted by uh, the girls that we liked by their parents to go out with them because we were Mexican. And, and so, I, I, you know, you, you, and I had the same experience when I went to college. So I realized that a lot of the, a lot of the prejudice that exists in our country is based on ignorance. And, and if people would learn about the richness of our culture, as well as the richness of other, other cultures, um, that we would, it would help a lot to erase those, those uh, walls that separate us from one another. Um, and so I, I have devoted my professional life to writing about those experiences that I had as a child because I realized that they were not just my experiences, they were the experiences of many, many families from the past and the present. Families who work very, very hard from sunup to sundown for low wages, living in poor living conditions, and thanks to their hard and noble work, uh, we enjoy our meals every single day. And thanks to their hard work, we are a richer, a richer country in terms of the culture that uh, Mexicans have contributed to our society, as well as from the work that, that, that our um, um, people have contributed to our society. So I feel that um, my heritage has um, helped me um, move ahead and to be proud, but not to the extent of excluding other cultures, as you pointed out, because we're, after all, we're all members of the same family, the human family. And so it seems to me what we have to do in our schools is to be inclusive, 
to have a curriculum that includes everyone. Nobody should be left out so that every child going through the curriculum can see themselves reflected in those, in those works. And so I, uh, anyway, I, I am proud of being my heritage. Be proud to be Wero too, man. Le digo, me castigo Dios. Oh, wow. That's wonderful. Anyway. So, Let me introduce, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, uh, we were talking about him for a little bit, uh, the new, the incoming speaker of the California State Assembly, Robert Rivas is here. Hey! Uh, I, I, and I heard they were throwing fregazos in the back in the back room, trying to get make this happen. So uh, re talk about resiliency right here. Go ahead, Dolores. No, I was just going to add to uh, your comment. You know, my my grandfather was wedo, like you, my mother's dad, and uh, my dad's my mother's family they were Hispanic Spanish, but my dad's family was from Mexico, right? Durango and Zacatecas. But my grandfather was wedito, like you, and uh, but, <laughs> but he would he would always say to. To every, I was born in New Mexico, yeah. and you know that he was uh, during that whole time during the Mexican Revolution and all that. But my grandfather, to his dying day, said que era mexicano, okay? Que era mexicano. He told us you're Mexican. The other thing, he would not ever let us speak uh, English in his presence. If you want to talk to my grandfather, he had to speak Spanish, okay? And he could speak English as well as I do, but he made us speak Spanish and uh, hang on to our language. And this is, sounds a little bit racist, okay? But he always said, <clears throat> you have to speak Spanish because English is the language of liars. He said, no tienen palabra. You know, they, they don't keep their word, they have to put everything in writing, okay? <laughs> because back there when he grew up, in the, and that was the days of the Wild West, Billy the Kid and all of those, you know, if you called a man a liar, you, they could kill you for calling a man a liar, okay? But that was really important because he made us, you know, say, yeah. era no mexicano, so I, think, I, I really appreciate what you That's said. really an important point, you know, because we live in a culture, and we have to learn this, you know, we acculturate, as Chicanos, we've had to acculturate the Anglo way of life, and what you learn to do is to work with contracts. Mm -hmm. you, you work with deals that are written down on paper, because with the invention of writing and paper, and contracts, that loosened up the need for people to tell the truth mm. abiertamente, you know what I mean? They could lie. And we see that at the highest levels of politics today, uh, with all the mass media, that lying is a way of life. But eventually it gets resolved supposedly in the courts because of the contract. Come back to the written word, okay? Mm. And, and the Bible is a contract, supposedly go back to the word, but the fact is that in the indigenous communities, since they didn't rely on contracts, they relied on people's word, on people's honesty. And that's another quality about indigenous culture that we have to value and respect, that the idea of telling the truth is part of the way of life because it's, it, you're no contracts there. It, it's the contract of telling the truth. And so it, it, that, it's a very subtle point, but it's a, point that racks us to the very root, you know, in terms of our way of life. And, and we have to learn, we have to acculturate. I tell young people, learn the way that American society works. There's, there are legal and contractual responsibilities that you have to abide by if you're not going to get entangled. The credit system is that way. You know, watch out what you're signing. And so all of that is part of the education of the citizen. We have to be good citizens in terms of the contact of society. But it starts with human respect. You've got to respect yourself enough to be able to tell the truth to whoever you're talking to. The moment that that goes, uh, we're in serious danger. And it's going to take a major effort in the world today, all over, to recover the truth, to pull back the lie. It's not just Trump that's lying. The whole world is lying. Uh, uh, people have been lying out of Russia for a long time. They've been distorting and misinforming people. They continue to do it to this very day, and the whole world has unfortunately learned to do the same thing. So all of you young people have a serious challenge ahead of you, how to protect the truth and how to maintain 
the truth in the face of the lie. Mm -hmm. That's one more thing. Go ahead, Dolores. Uh, There's another thing, too, I think. Uh, we, we, we recently had a scandal in Los Angeles, a scandal where we had uh, uh, elected leaders of our community, some of them in pretty high places, uh, that were making fun of the people from Oaxaca, okay? And we do have that veneno, we have that poison in our community of colorism, you know, and we have to accept that and we have to fight against it. You know, they say, cuando nace el niño, que bonito, o que bonita la niña porque está bien verita, you know? You know, they have light eyes, light hair. We have to, we have to fight against that. And the other thing, I'm, I'm gonna throw this in, some people may not agree with me, but you know, two Nobel Peace uh, Prize winners just recently got the Nobel Peace Prize because they were studying us, humans. And the sentence is this, 70,000 years ago, when human beings came out of Africa, human beings, us, came out of Africa, okay? And we have to remember that, that we are one human race, homo sapiens, and our human race began in Africa. Traveled across the planet, got lighter in skin, lighter in eyes. But at the end of the day, we are all Africans, okay? That's where our human species began. So we can say to all the neo-Nazis out there, the white supremacist, get over it, you're Africans, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to ask everybody, take the hand of the person next to you. Agarren la mano de la persona a su lado. Take, okay? Hold each other's hands. Yeah, everybody. Turn to that person and say, hello, relative. <laughs> hello, relative. That reminds us that we are one human race, right? Right. Okay. It's also important to acknowledge our brothers and sisters uh, in, in this country, in the movement. Uh, again, speaking as a Chicano, going back, actually before I, I joined Dolores and Cesar in Delano, I was heavily involved in the civil rights movement. It was because I saw that the black struggle was my struggle. As a matter of fact, I was called a black man in certain circles. For some people, I, I was the embodiment of black power, you know? Not Chicano power, black power. And, and so I learned to respect the civil rights movement because it was my movement. And, and the inspiration for theater, for Teatro Campesino, also came from a group called the Free Southern Theater, which was based in New York, but they used to tour into the racist South. They were both black and white actors going into the racist South, and they couldn't live in the South, but they lived in New York. And, and that became a great, they, they started in 1965, just before the teatro. And, and so that inspired me. Members of that group, the leaders of that group, became my friends. And so I was inspired by that. Right now, I mean, the young people are going to see Wakanda forever. And, and you've got to see Tenoch Huerta in there, who's doing Namor, the Mariner of the Seas who's now been equated in Hollywood again with uh, Kukulkan, with uh, Itzamna, with the, age, the most ancient and oldest of the pre-Columbian gods. And, and Tenoch Huerta is a brown man, an indígena, who's complained about how brown people are treated in Mexico. Uh, he, uh, one of my sons actually, our youngest son, Joaquin, was going to act with him in a movie they were going to do about the conquest of Mexico. It never got made because of the pandemic. But Tenoch was going to play uh, uh, Moctezuma, yeah. Ilui Camina. And, but it's great to see that he's now achieving worldwide status, playing an indigenous uh, deity, playing Kukulkan. And all of that is because the makers of Wakanda Forever, the black African-American filmmakers, have reached out to embrace the indigenous world, okay? Now this is an answer to all those people in one moment in our community that whisper behind the scenes about mayates and you know and, and you know the language yes it, it i know that my wife lupe encountered a, a woman who we were in texas actually some speaking engagement and when obama was running and she had the obama button right lupe and uh, there was a woman in a drugstore a mexicana a chicana who saw that and he said Por qué tienes el botón? 
And she said, well, I'm, I'm supporting Obama. And she said, no, yo nunca votaría por un negro. Wow. wow. Okay? Now you know that that's a reality in our community. And as Dolores says, we've got to confront that within our own families, within our own communities, you know, and that kind of racism cannot be allowed to exist. And we can add machismo to that. <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about identity uh, for a bit here. Um, and I remember it was, uh, again, going back to first day of kindergarten and to break the ice again, you know, you, you go down the list, the teacher's calling roll, and it's Ricky here and uh, Lucy here and uh, Rodrigo here. And the teacher says, Damien, Damien? I'm like, ¿Quién fregado es Damien? <laughs> <laughs> my name was Damian. <laughs> and so my name became Damien from there, and that became the Americanization of Damien through Hio, was it was in that kindergarten class. Um, and people ask me, I've been hosting my show for 26 years now at NBC, and people ask me, when are you going to... People ask me, when are you going to rel relinquish that show? When are you going to find somebody else to do it? And I say, when I find the next Damien Trujillo, when I find somebody who cares so much about this community that is putting them on the spotlight and making sure that their message gets across. So my question, Dolores, is do we see another Dolores Huerta out there? Do we have, I, have, we, have we identified somebody or is it a chavalita here in this room? Oh, let me tell you, there are a lot of young Latina activists out there, not just young, uh, also middle-aged Latina activists, even some uh, revolutionary abuelas out there. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, everywhere I go, you know, I, last week I was, in, uh, uh, I was in Nevada, and I was in Georgia, and I was in Michigan. And everywhere you go, you have, you know, our people are on fire, okay? They're out there organizing, they're uh, making things a lot better. But, but it, it takes not thinking of yourself, right? It takes thinking of the greater good. Because if you thought about yourself and what you did, you'd never get to be the Dolores Huerta that you are now. Yeah, that's the thing I want to say to everybody here, and I know Luis knows this and you know it also, uh, Francisco, is that when you are out there trying to help people and you're doing things in your community, you forget about your personal problems. We all have problems. We have family problems. If you're in school, you have school problems. But when you're focusing on organizing people and delivering that message of justice that we can do this, que si podemos, you know, you forget about your own personal issues. And you know what? They're going to get resolved one way or the other, you know, eventually, you know? And that really, because uh, you're, you're, you're empowering other people is what you're doing. And so you forget about yourself. And then I think that's again what, what gives you that kind of energy that we need and that, that what we're doing is so, so important because we know that the issues that we talked about, like the prison system, the fact that our, our kids and our school systems are not getting the equity and quality education that they deserve. And we're the only ones that can change that. You know, we know our healthcare systems here are very discriminatory against people of color. And those are the things that have to be changed. The environment, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, trying to save the planet. These are big issues that we're confronting. But our people have to know because of the, we have such a huge population now that we've got to get in the mix. We've got to get, uh, we've got to get in the lucha, you know? We are the ones that can make it happen. But people have to understand that at the core of their being, that we have the power to do that. Thank you. They're allowing us to, to have the audience ask uh, questions of any of our panelists. So uh, if you want to get uh, ready for that, um, let me just ask one more question before we do that. Um, Dr. Jimenez's uh, is documentary, it's in the post-production stages now, right? We're getting ready to, to launch it. So you, you read the books, uh, now get ready to watch the documentary. Uh, Don Luis, what's next for you? We talked about, you talked about the project you were working during the pandemic that fell through. What can we expect out of... Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, I have a book out. It, it's available on Amazon. It's called Theater of the Sphere, The Vibrant Being. And it's the distillation of 50 years of work with El Teatro Campesino, 
but it goes back into my own thought, and some of the ideas that I've been expressing here are in the book. It's, it's a slim book, but uh, it's published out of uh, Rutledge Press in London and New York. It's on uh, it, Amazon, you look for it. I also have my autobiography coming out next year. Oh, wow. Uh, the, the story that I told about my scalding is in that book, you know, now the personal stories. And uh, you may have seen my play, uh, Valley of the Heart. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, about the love story, you know, between Japanese, American, and Mexican. Well, that's now a screenplay, and, and uh, I've asked Eddie Ormos to direct it. And uh, we're uh, lining up the financing, and so uh, we're still... It's bad luck, actually, in Hollywood to talk about these things too much. But, uh, <laughs> but you can in blame any me. case, you should know that uh, that's in motion. And uh, hopefully, you know, in a couple of years, you get, get to see a movie, you know? So uh, the world goes on. Uh, there's, there's El Teatro Campesino is still closed because of the pandemic. We've seen other companies try to pull together shows, and then half the cast gets COVID. So we're wrestling with that, as well as retrofitting the old Teatro building, a packing shed. But we hope to open this next year in 2000, uh, 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 well, the next coming year. And, uh, and it will continue to produce. There's a whole new generation at the helm of El Teatro Campesino, including uh, young female leaders, you know. Kid Christy Sandoval is our general manager. She's doing a wonderful job of keeping the torches burning. But then we have uh, uh, Manuel Rocha. Is he here? Manuel Rocha, are you here? Where are you, Manuel? Over there. He's our warrior prince. There he is, our oh. warrior poet prince. Uh, he has a book out, too, The Pain of the Warrior, which is brilliant, and, and uh, you should look that one up. And uh, anyway, uh, El Teatro Campesino is now in its 57th year, okay? And, and continuing, <laughs> continuing in its own modest way. We're still in our old packing shed place in San Juan Bautista because we feel that we have to be. We have to be in San Juan, but since we're in San Juan, we're also in Gilroy, okay? All right. Ah, lucky. <laughs> so if you, um, if you do have a question, there's two microphones here down the center. Just uh, line up right behind them. You can ask that question. I want to be doing. I'm sorry? Do you want to ask me what we're doing? Yeah. Oh. Before uh, Don Aron, uh, she's not done yet. She's got a lot of projects she's working on. Dolores, fill us in. Yes, yeah, well, uh, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, uh, we're going to be celebrating our 20th year, also next year. And... Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, we've, we've empowered a lot of uh, people, just regular, a lot of them are immigrants. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, they've uh, put up uh, in their communities, they've got neighborhood parks, they've got street lights, uh, curbs and gutters, uh, street lights, swimming pools. Um, uh, one of our committees has a, uh, actually worked to get a brand new gymnasium that they did not have in Wheat Patch, California. Anybody knows where Wheat Patch is at? I know you do. That's where the Grapes of Brass was filmed? Wheat Patch. Wheat, <laughs> wheat Patch. Wheat Patch, yes. wow. Yeah, that's uh, south of Bakersfield. Yeah. But, but more recently we were working, we signed up 84,000 people for the census, okay? 84,000 people. And uh, we worked on redistricting and all of our maps. So we, we have a great demographer named Jesus Garcia, a Mexicano, and uh, all of our maps were accepted by the Independent Commission, all right? Uh, we have recently vaccinated over nine. 9,000 people, okay, from COVID-19. And so <clears throat> we have a great youth group. Uh, we're in 17 different school districts, uh, covering over 200 schools. Uh, again, trying to stop that school to prison pipeline. Over 40% of our recommendations to the different uh, school uh, districts have been accepted by the school districts. And we have a great youth group. And so, we're continuing to organize at the grassroots level and getting our people elected to different school boards, city councils, uh, taking over the power. Okay, that's what it's all about. See you later. Oh, and I forgot one more thing. And we're building, we are building a peace and justice cultural center that will be dedicated to the farm workers in the Central Valley, wow. the people that feed us every day. It's beautiful. Mm. Yeah. So. Make sure you Google them, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, doing a lot of, a lot of great work. So when you ask a question, uh, say your name if you can, if you're with uh, an agency or who you're with, and then keep your questions short so we can get to everybody's. Go ahead. I don't resent this. Um, thank you to all of you that I know you and I have followed you uh, all your life. Oh, you know, you are an inspiration. But my question is to Dolores Huerta. 
Back on 2008, we made a rally against the police of San Jose. And I remember talking to you, you described the word justice, justicia, much better than English is my second language. I went to the dictionary in English and Spanish, but your version was the best. Can you please share the version of justicia, justice, what it is? Thank you. The version of what? Uh, one more time, uh, Don Aaron, explain, you want her to explain what? En español o en inglés, pero la palabra justicia coming from you. But just the palabra justicia. Life, the palabra. And, made me, and made me so powerful because we were rallying against San Jose police. And it's not easy to tell police what they are doing wrong. It's not easy. And I remember also when you went beat it up in San Francisco by police. So you know and understand what it is. But that time, you taught me or told me that word of justice better than anybody else. Yeah, the word justice. Well, to me, the word justice means uh, that if we had the perfect world, that as we did when we were the first humans on Earth, that we shared everything, no? That we shared everything and that people respected each other. I like to quote Benito Juarez, who says, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz, right? Respecting other people's rights is peace. It's not, we are not in, in a just world right now uh, when you have 90% of the wealth of the United States that is in the hands of 10% of the wealthy corporations you know, and the wealthy families, like Walmart, by the way. Friends don't let their friends shop at Walmart, okay? <laughs> but but this, is not a, this is not a just world. There is no reason why uh, we don't have free college education, we don't have free health care. Uh, there's no reason why we have homeless people on the streets right now. I mean, we are the richest country in the world. And if other countries in Europe and Scandinavia can have free health care, free education for everybody. If, if a little uh, country like Cuba, if Cuba, uh, which has uh, an economic boycott by the United States, they have free health care for all the citizens, you know? And they have free college education for all the citizens. If they can do it, we should be able to do it here. That is what justice is, that nobody should have to suffer hunger or shelter in a country. And people should be treated equally, regardless of of what they look like or what their economic status is. That to me is justice, a world of peace. All right, thank you. Yeah. It's a little difficult to hear the questions up here, so if you can just speak up for us. Gracias. Sure. Um, thank you very, so this microphone's on. Okay, Ooh. thank you very much for uh, hearing from all of you. My question is, um, Dolores, your co career in activism is one that has been highlighted by your ability to focus on the human element. You put a face on issues that people didn't really see much, whether it was the harm done by DDT pesticides or the conditions of farm workers. Uh, we now live in the digital age of the internet where we have democratized the ability for anybody to get access to public attention, but on some sides that has removed the human element of a lot of issues as they become atomized. So my question is, what role do you see the internet playing as we continue to fight the good fight? The internet? A, a little louder, your, your question a little louder. Is oh, a little I apologize. Um, your career has been one that has been highlighted by your ability to put a human face on issues. Uh, and to highlight the humanitarian aspects of a lot of issues. Now that we live in the digital age of the internet and we've democratized the ability for anybody to get access to public attention, uh, but in some ways that's also removed kind of the human element, what role did you three see for the internet playing as a tool as we continue to fight the good fight and move forward on these progressive issues? Everybody's on the internet now, yeah. so how do well, we? Well, I, I think that the internet uh, is really good because it has been able to uh, get education out there to people. It has helped to mobilize people, like we saw that with the uh, marches that happened after George Floyd was killed, with the Me Too movement, with the immigrant rights movement. But people have to be, uh, they already have to know something about that issue. But we know at the same time that there's a lot of misinformation, right, on the internet. So people still have to be educated so that they can know uh, what is the right information and what is information that is misleading. Uh, I think that's that's the problem that we have to kind of get people to be able to sort that out. But you know, somebody was with the Dalai Lama and they asked the Dalai Lama, uh, do you think we'll ever have peace in the world? And he said, yes. 
He said, really? How? He said, the internet. Okay? <laughs> so, so that's kind of uh, your answer, but at the same time, I still think like the people to people, organizing is still important. We can do a lot of organizing on the internet, and there has been a lot of organizing, but there's still some people that they need to be organized because uh, you know, they're still confused, okay? No se les ha aprendido el foco, I like to say, you know? They didn't need to be enlightened, and so you do have to have some personal conversations with people so that they can ask questions and you try to give them the answers that they need to, to hear so that they can understand what's going on in society and why, how we, we can create a just world. All right, go ahead. Thank you very much. Hi. Hola, mi nombre is Jacqueline Castillo, and my question is for Francisco. Uh, my question is, um, how was your experience as a first-generation um, college student, and how would you get, what advice would you give to first-generation college students to not lose motivation? Yeah. Um, as, as you know, many of our students coming in uh, to universities are, are first-generation college students. And based on my experience, um, when I first went to Santa Clara my freshman year, uh, I, I found myself in a very different environment than the environment in which I was raised. And then everyone around me seemed so much smarter, um, seemed much more prepared than I was. And, uh, and then I felt guilty being at the university, knowing that my parents were still struggling economically, working in the fields. And in moments when I felt that way, I began to reflect on my childhood experiences to give me the courage not to give up. Um, I compare my situation then to a man who is drowning. A man who is drowning uses the water, the very substance that threatens his life to save himself. Likewise, I used my childhood experiences that were initially pulling me back to boost myself and not to give up. And, and, I, and then I thought, you know, so many people made it possible for me to go to college. I didn't do it on my own, right? I had wonderful teachers. Uh, and so I felt that I didn't want to give, I didn't want to fail them because they believed in me. So that helped me. Uh, and I also thought of uh, how my education uh, would be used to eventually make a difference in our society. And so that's why I wrote these books, because I, I, I wanted people to have a more empathy, more appreciation, more respect, more, more gratitude towards immigrants, many of whom are mixed um, uh, migrant workers. So knowing that, I think, if you think about uh, what it took for you to be where you are, the sacrifices that your parents made, mm. honor their sacrifices by doing well, right? So that's my advice to Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Most of you are going to be very upset with us, but we have a 3.30 hard stop. Uh, the library system has some programs going on. Uh, our guests have uh, busy schedules as well, so you're going to forgive us if we have to stop it at 3.30. But ma'am, you have the next question. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be in your presence. My name is Maria Delgado. Um, I'm a proud daughter of immigrants. I, um, I mean, I wanted to ask you, you touched a little bit on um, the school system pushing our youth out. Um, I see this happen all of the time. And um, I, want us, I want your opinion on what I, as a parent of um, two or three kids, um, can do to help support those parents who no necessarily cannot advocate for themselves. I want to help advocate for our youth and help the parents who cannot advocate for themselves um, to keep their kids from getting pushed out of the mainstream schools. You want to take that, Don Luis? How do you we help parents advocate for themselves? How do you have parents? Advocate for themselves when they aren't doing that. Um, you know, when they're doing what? When they're not advocating. How do we get them to advocate for oh, themselves? Instead, instead of relying on people to advocate for them. What do we do with my foundation? Well, there's a number of different angles. I mean, there's a very practical angle that a better job, you know, has uh, better wages, you know, for one. 
that's just good self-interest, you know. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, parents that don't understand and, and don't respect the value of education uh, need help in some basic way. Uh, uh, little kids, a lot of kids sometimes can get that over, you know, in the sense that if parents, regardless of their educational level, love their kids, I mean, they'll respect them uh, as human beings. And so there's some hope there. Uh, but I think that, you know, we all exist in a, we all exist in an atmosphere, we all exist in a, in a plenum of, of, of social attitudes and social thinking. And so in some ways the community has to reinforce those values. The community has to uh, encourage parents to respect education for what it is. Uh, you know, my dad uh, couldn't help me out to go to college, but he gave me a scholarship. He said, don't worry about your brothers and sisters. Because, of course, in the Mexican family, the older kids, and I was number two, uh, have to help the younger set, right? And there were eight brothers and sisters behind me. And so, but I, I, I never forgot that, that he was kind enough and sharp enough to know that I, I couldn't help, but he wasn't going to impose on me to leave school to help the kids. So uh, I found that, uh, and my dad only went to the fifth grade. His dad died when he was 12, so he worked his whole life. There was no way around it. Uh, but he had a great deal of respect for books. Uh, he bought a, a set of encyclopedias that we carried from camp to camp when we were migrant farm workers. And that was our education at the time. There was no internet, there was no radio, there was no television. We just used to open up the encyclopedias and, and look at the pictures, you know, and until we could read. And uh, when my dad died, we took the remaining books of that encyclopedia and spread them to my brothers and sisters. So. I have one, my brothers and sisters have one, and, and that's my dad's legacy to us. Uh, the most important thing was love. And I think that one thing that parents do understand, regardless of their educational level, is love for their kids. You gotta tap into that. And the community has to respond to that. If you love your kids, let them go to school. Let them get educated. Thank you. I, I wanna, Thank you. I wanna, I want to add to the answer. This is exactly what my foundation is doing. We organize the parents, and we organize them through house meetings, and we talk about the issues in education. And so we, every chapter that we have, we're in four different counties. We're in Los Angeles County, the Antelope Valley. We're in Kern, Tulare, and Fresno County. And every one of our places where we are, we organize the parents, and we set up an education committee. And then we teach them how, you know, in California, we have the law that uh, Governor Jerry Brown actually passed when he was governor and the legislature that they have to set up a welcoming environment for the students. And guess what? The parents can look at the budgets, see where the money is going to. And well, our education committees have been so successful. They've actually gotten rid of a few, a few people that were taking money, you know, from the till for education. Uh, they've uh, gotten rid of a couple of uh, other principals, uh, but they did it from the ground up. And we would love to work with you to help you organize the parents, okay? All Thank right. you. <laughs> Thank you. There's also, there's also the cultural aspect, you know. It's really important that and parents and families understand that. Uh, uh, Dia de los Muertos, uh, uh, all of the celebrations, the Virgen de Guadalupe, all of the, are, are events that celebrate the family and celebrate our consciousness. I saw the Aztec dancers over here. It fills my heart when I see all of the Aztec dancers all over the state, all over the country now. Because in 1970, El Teatro Campesino hosted El Maestro Andres Segura y Granados. He was El Capitan de Danza who introduced danza into the Chicano community. And he came to El Teatro Campesino to do it. And now it's become a wave you know, of cultural uh, reawakening. It, 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 if you haven't put on feathers, <laughs> I recommend that you try it sometimes. We've done it at the teatro. Because if you, if you hate being Mexican or if you're ambivalent about, about your own indigenous background, man, nothing cures it better than putting on a big penacho and uh, <laughs> salir medio encuerao, you know, and say, wow, I feel, I, I feel like myself, you know? And so that's what all these young people are doing. And parents understand that too, okay? And that those right. feathers will humble you because my penacho kept falling off. It wanted to do its own danza. So, Rosana here, a veces hay que no pedir permiso and take the microphone anyway because this be really question fast. here is gonna be fast. And it's maybe more of a question for all of us to reflect on together. 
but I see you all up here on stage. You all have been definitive guides for those of us showing up, putting our energy into the ground, having that movimiento in action. And I see the people showing up to hear you speak, and it's beautiful, it's moving. And at the same time, there's an air of disappointment that when we call on folks and we're just people, que la gente, and I don't mean our people, because si llegamos, but the allies, right? The allies in the room that can see you at your stature, fail to see the mothers, fail to see the grandmothers, fail to see my babies, and say, yes, they too are a part of that legacy. So my question, with all the emotion here, is in your wisdom and in your generosity to share your stories with us, your testimonio, your spirit, what can we say to the folks in the room who have opted out and are here today and can maybe be here in the fields, in the streets, talking about our kids being pushed out today, right now, next week? Gracias. Well, yeah, I can, I can share with you, uh, the, you know, the, I think that it would change my life. When I met Fred Ross Sr., and he said, I had been a school teacher and I actually quit teaching to become an organizer because this is what he said. We have the power to solve our own issues. We cannot wait for somebody to come in on a white horse and do it for us, okay? So people just have to understand that. Que nosotros tenemos el poder en sí mismo. And all we have to do, get together, organize, come together, use direct action to put pressure on the politicians or whomever it may be, the people that are oppressing our people. We have the power to change that. And I think that, you know, I was so uh, blessed by meeting uh, Fred Roth Sr. He's the one that organized Cesar, I organized myself. I know Luis got part of his instruction also. Uh, but that's the one thing that we have to remember, that we have the power. All right. Absolutely. Can I, can I, can I take the yeah. Okay. I apologize. I was told just one more question uh, from the young man. Mijo, can you grab that microphone? And I want you to ask your question right up here, okay? Quítale el micrófono de allí y vente para acá, mijo. Right here. All right. This question is mainly to Francisco. How did you remember all your experiences from your uh, first book? How did I remember all those things uh, <laughs> when, I, when I wrote the first book? Yeah. Before I began writing it, I did a lot of research. I interviewed my mother, my older brother. Uh, I went to the San Joaquin Valley where we lived in migrant camps to, to help me uh, remember the past. I also listened to Mexican music, ranchera, that we listened <laughs> when we were kids. And that, all of that brought back memories. Um, so that's, uh, and that's, that's what helped me remember the past. And, and, and some of the stories that I include in the book, they're memorable stories. That I, I they, they stayed with me as a child, remembering all those, those things that I write in that book. Whenever I couldn't remember details, like the number of the school bus, I invented it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, Thank you uh, all, all so much for being here. We're going to um, end it with some final comments um, briefly from our panelists. We're going to start with Dr. Jimenez and work our way down. We're going to end with Dolores. And final thoughts, final comments. De usted. Final comment. We'll oh, start with you. Well, um, my, uh, I just want to thank uh, all of you for, for being here. Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, and I, uh, I want to thank uh, Damien and, and Dolores and Luis for inspiring me. And um, I just want, I'm, I feel very um, blessed that uh, we are surrounded by a community that cares about each other and, are, um, and have hopes that uh, you will continue uh, your efforts to improve the lives of everyone and so that we can create a community where no one, no one is left out. 
that we, after all, as we indicated on this panel, after all, we're all together. We're all members of the same family, the human family. So when one person in our community suffers, we all suffer. So thank you so much. Thank you. Les urjo que corran la voz, you know, correr la voz. It's really important that the word go out, that things are moving ahead. Don't let the negatives take you under. Don't let yourself get depressed. Don't allow yourself to be defeated by other people's fears of you. They fear you because you are powerful. They fear you because you are the people. And I believe in the human race. I believe in human history. There are ups and downs, there's no question about it. In our lifetime, there have been a lot of ups and downs. But most of the journey, as I can see it, has been up. I believe in our young people. Our young people need to know that they're beautiful, that they're geniuses, that they're brilliant, that there isn't just one Dolores Huerta out there. There are one, two, three, four, five, five, five million Dolores Huertas out there because this Dolores Huerta has inspired you. And, and so just one final note. Believe in the power of the arts. The arts are our way of life. And so we need cultural centers. We need music. We need plays. We need movies. If I hadn't gone to Delano to be on a flatbed truck and to do actos con campesinos, I never would have made it onto the sound stages of Hollywood. I never would have made it to Broadway. Because I had been in Delano, I knew I could talk to producers. I knew that I could handle a multi-million dollar budget. You begin where you begin as Fred Ross. If you wait until the conditions are ready and perfect for you to begin, you'll never begin. Begin now with what you've got. Work with what you've got. Y adelante. I, uh, I can listen to this man all day, every day. You name it. That's, thank you, Don Luis. Dolores, you have the final word. Uh, well, uh, I just want to thank you very, very much for being here, for gi giving up your Sunday to be here with all of us because uh, you're giving us a gift of your time, which is the most precious thing that you have. And I'm going to ask you uh, to use your time again to become activists and to be able to go out there and help our community, especially the people that need the help the most. And maybe we could ask uh, uh, Robert Rivas to come up and join the stage with us, because I'm going to ask all of you to do something, okay? okay. I'm going to ask, I want all of you to stand up. Right next to her. Right next to the books. I think we found the next Dolores. Yeah. Uh, we just mentioned that uh, Robert's going to be the next speaker of the State Assembly. And uh, he's going to be passing a lot of laws to help us, okay? But he's going to need all of your help to make it happen, all right? Because there's a lot of pressures when you get up there to Sacramento. So I'm going to ask all of you two questions, all right? Two questions. <laughs> okay, you want to help me? Let's ask him some questions, okay? The first question I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you, who's got the power? I want you to say, we've got the power. Second question, what kind of power? I want you to say, people power, all right? Can we do that? Hey. And we want to shout it really, really loud. Okay, let's go, let's ask him, okay? Who's got the power? We've got the power. Okay, some people aren't sure. Okay, one, more, one more time, one more time. One more time, everybody really loud. Who's got the power? We've got the power. What kind of power? People power. Are we going to use our power to make conditions better for our community, to help Robert out there, a speaker of the State Assembly of the United States? What do we say? Se puede o no se puede? Si se puede. Se puede o no se puede? Si se puede. Okay, let's do it with an organized hand clap. Let's go. Si se puede. Si se puede. Que viva! Que viva! 
Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Francisco Jimenez, Don Luis Valdez, and Doña Dolores Huerta, Robert Rivas. Hello. Hey, Robert. Yeah. Congratulations. Make us all proud. All right.